Yeah, yeah. In fact, actually, I, sometimes I don't even say that you're necessarily under-eating protein. Sometimes I think these people are under-eating food in general. Yes. I think a lot oh, of yeah. times yeah. they're just eating. It, it doesn't even have to do with fat or protein. Again, I think that, yes, you're right. The protein has more of the significant effect that they're trying to look for, that they're actually lacking, which is why they're developing symptoms. But if they just upped their food in general, up both the fat and the protein, even irrespective of the ratio, mm. just keep the ratio the same, up your food intake. I've actually been saying this it seems a little like oddly specific and weird, but it's it's really, it's something that once I said it, I sort of said it like casually, like, you know, just off the cuff. And and I had a bunch of people, I still continue to have a bunch of people say, you know what? I, I realized I experienced the exact same thing. I noticed that I can get double the amount of protein in one meal if I don't eat ground beef or minced meat. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times people are eating a lot of minced meat and I go, and, and then if you, if you, if you're sort of, if you're going to tie it into the sort of ancestral consistency model, when we killed an animal and hunted one, you, well, we hunted one and ate it, were we eating minced, like all, all the animal, just grind it all up and eat it that way? Like, no, we were eating actual parts of the muscle meat that are sort of, they're, they're more integrated they're, you take a piece off. Mm-hmm. So you're not grinding anything up. You're not grinding all parts of the, of, of the animal up into, into one sort of amalgam of food. Not to say that you shouldn't be eating ground beef. If you don't have any problems with it, then go ahead. But I was saying, you know, that's one thing to, to consider is maybe you're eating way too much of that because, I mean, we know that a lot of the, well, a lot of people, at least um, a lot of the the influencers in the space, they, they promote a lot of burger patties. Uh, they promote a lot of bowls of ground beef, which again, I'm not denigrating for doing that. However, I'm just saying potentially that's a problem if you're, if you're seeing that you're ostensibly under eating under eating on, on food. I had the problem actually a while back. I was getting, I didn't have actual like serious problems, but I remember thinking to myself, I'm getting a little cold, like quite a bit, like way too cold than I should be. And I noticed that I was just, I was like, oh, well, I mean, let's, th- if, if maybe, maybe it is a problem, maybe I should be eating more, but wow, this is really weird. Like, why can't I eat that much food? And then I start switching to steaks, completely different story. I can get like, it, it's just completely different story. And so it's, it, does that, but, but those people would have thought, well, car, it's carnivore. It's mm. carnivore, man. Got to quit. Got to add those carbs back in. Your T3's tanked because, because of your heat. You oh, know, yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this and is. This all is of it has thing. to do with insulin. All, all of it has to do with insulin. But, and, and like, like a T3 level going down is not necessarily indicative of a problem. Not like it's, it, not at all. Not you have to look at the thyroid numbers in context with one another. Like, for example, if you have really, really high TSH and then your T3 is just bottoming out, okay, maybe something's wrong. Usually you'll be symptomatic if, if there's something going on, <laughs> by the way. But if, if they're all present in balance with one another, you don't just look at the absolute levels and go, oh, you have a problem. Obviously, if you're going to be exhibiting lower insulin, you're going to have less T4 to T3 conversion because insulin is the thing that upregulates it to go, to, to upregulates the conversion process. That doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily have a problem. It's just based on arbitrary metrics. Like it's really goes into the repeat argument. You should be measuring your body temperature and make sure it's a certain level because that's a sign that your thyroid is functioning properly because your metabolic rate is higher. You want a higher metabolic rate. And it's like, well, does where does that rule stop? Are you saying that the faster, the better always in every circumstance? No, you'd probably recognize, oh, well, of course there's a cutoff. You don't want a hyperthyroidism. You don't want to actually like get into a too high of a metabolism. It's like, okay, so you say there's a cutoff there. Why are you saying then that the opposite, sort of the antithesis to that isn't true, where the lower the metabolism, the worse always. It's like, oh, well, that, that doesn't work either. If you're going to say that there's a diminishing return here, you have, to, you have to also say that there's a diminishing return on the other end. You can't say that it, the worse, the, the lower the thyroid hormone, the worse always. It's like, that doesn't, that doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. There's a lower amount. There's just this amount. And it's, a, it's sure, it's a metric of your metabolic rate, but you shouldn't be saying that the function is linear and that the more, the better, the lower, the worse. It depends on context. That's not how, that's not how the body works. Like it's just yeah. arbitrary cutoffs throughout the whole time or throughout the whole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the T3 thing makes, does make me laugh because normally the people that are saying the T3 is tanked are also complaining about gluconeogenesis being stressful. One thing I always want to say to them is you do realize that T3 induces gluconeogenesis. So you're saying on one hand, gluconeogenesis is stressful, but you want one of the, one of the main drivers of gluconeogenesis to be higher. So get your, get your story straight. That's the, that's the first thing. Secondly, you know, it's a physiological adaptation. It's not pathology. It goes lower because you need much less T3. T3 is 
um, absolutely essential in glycolysis, moving fibrin back across the mitochondrial membrane. You need lots of it when you eat lots of carbs. You're going to have yes, less. Yes, exactly. Less. And it's just one of those things. And also, I mean, the thyroid is you know, re remarkable because it's one of the few things it does the futile processing in the body. So it builds up and burns down and breaks down at the same time. It's anabolic and catabolic at the same time. And that's, that's why it's the metabolic mastermind, really, because that's what it's doing. It's, it's running these futile processes all the time. So we need adequate levels. And what, what is happening, your body is giving that feedback and saying, I'm a bit cold, so you need to eat a bit more food, which will, in the end, produce a little bit more um, of, of a response. And you will see your T3 be appropriate and get you to the right level of, of heat of body temperature but i do think mm -hmm. we also run a little bit um colder because we have less body fat i think it's one of the things yep. as well so yeah i i think one of the things that's getting me about this is none of it is joined up and a lot of it is completely wrong they talk about cold cell for instance saying it's a stress oh, hormone. yeah it's not it's yeah, a homeostatic, yeah, yeah it's a homeostatic hormone it's not a stress hormone it reacts in stress, but it also reacts when it needs to bring your blood pressure down, your blood pressure Exactly. Down. It does both. And it's not even cortisol that they're talking about. They're actually talking about the effect of epinephrine and norepinephrine. They're talking about that stress response and saying- Oh, that's yeah. And that's, and that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Because I'm, I'm, I just reacted to a video from Zane, by the way. He, his name keeps getting mentioned here. Um, that's It's actually coincidental because I'm not- purposely trying to pick on him specifically but uh he he talks about how he, he was talking about oh not just not just cortisol is is stimulated when you're on a carnivore diet which by the way it begs an entire question as to whether that's a bad thing just as a side comment here as a, as a direct response to what you were saying this is my main problem yes cortisol is almost any distressing event is usually going to involve cortisol it doesn't mean that every event that involves cortisol is a distressing event that doesn't yeah. that's not how that works that's not how that works so he wants to talk about cortisol. I already talked, you know, I, I responded to that claim, but then he talks about epinephrine and norepinephrine too. He brings those up and I go, do you know any carnivores that are ex experiencing problems with adrenaline and noradrenaline? Or are you just, I don't understand. Like what, that isn't even a claim made in these communities of people having problems. It's all, it's, it's always cortisol. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, okay, that. <laughs> Cortisol is, in, is a hormone that is critical to gluconeogenics, gluconeogenesis. Mm. It is a hormone that is responsible for the production of three primary gluconeogenic enzymes, the major, major regulatory enzymes, those being phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase, Pepsi-K, pyruvate carboxylase, and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Mm. You learn that in, in biochemistry, like explicitly in the lesson gluconeogenesis, or the, the lessons, plural, because usually it's split up into a few. It's, it's a basic physiological fact. And oftentimes you'll look at these studies that will observe these, these cortisol responses in people that are adopting a carnivore diet. First of all, they're over short durations, pretty short durations. They're immediately transitioned. So there's no like transition period before the diet of like six to eight weeks. They just are put on the diet. But also in some of these studies, you can actually see that the cortisol level, yes, it goes up and then it goes down. It's yeah. acute. It yeah. goes right back down. And so it's like, this is the reason why it's also important to assess the duration of time that the studies went on for that you're looking at. Because if, you, if you're looking at a study that went on for two weeks, can you extrapolate those results beyond a two-week period or a two-week tenure? That's not how that works. You can't just look as strictly, like exclusively at that. So I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you brought cortisol up because, man, oh, well, I'm glad. And also, if I hear cortisol again, I'm going to lose my mind. But you know, it's, well, it's an adaptive homeostatic hormone. It's not a stress hormone. No, yeah, it, it yeah. Adapts. And also, they seem to think that it's a primary driver of blood glucose, but it isn't. Glucagon is. They keep forgetting. That was what I was going to say. Glu Zane actually mentioned glucagon is a stress hormone itself. He called it oh, a stress hormone. Word. Oh, my word. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So that uh -huh. must mean that insulin is also. Oh, no. So if, if they're the yin and the yang. So if he reckons this is the joined up thinking, straight off the top of my head, if that's a stress hormone, then insulin is an anti stress hormone. Is that right? Yeah, no. basically. 
Yeah, I mean, right. right. Exactly. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Glucagon is just stress hormone. But that's the other thing that I actually said in response. It was like, I was like, okay, well, glucagon is the prototypical catabolic hormone. Okay. Mm. Insulin is the prototypical anabolic hormone. I'm glad that you actually just said the yang and the yin, because I literally have said it's the yin and yang. You can think of them as, as yin and yang mm. because they have directly antagonistic effects. They basically do the exact same thing as the other thing, but the exact opposite, diametrically opposed to each other. Yeah. If, if you're going to say that that prototypical catabolic hormone is bad and stressful, you must then say that catabolism is stressful. And in fact, he actually said that in the video. He said, well, catabolism is, is a, you know, you don't want to break down anything. And I went, hold on, aren't you talking about losing fat? Aren't you talking about people that are struggling with losing fat? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then people should be getting fatter. What animal is designed to be constantly, consistently in an anabolic state? None. No animal. You're not supposed to be primarily in an anabolic state. Okay. That fact alone should just render the whole high carbohydrate diet, standard American diet thing, just completely, just, just run, just, it eviscerates the entire claim. And it eviscerates the entire idea because what's the idea behind that? You should be eating three times a day to maintain blood glucose levels and you should have snacks in between and fasting is really bad. And so you have to break your fast in the morning. You have to have breakfast because you fasted for eight hours during your sleep. You really think that your body is stressed out during sleep because you're in a catabolic state? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's absolute nonsense. <laughs> like, obviously you don't want constant catabolism or else you'll starve to death. Good thing that's not what we're advocating for. <laughs> like, the, good thing that's not what's going on. So anyway, yeah, I'm glad we got that out of the way too, because the whole stress hormone argument, and there's no, there's really no such thing as a stress hormone. There's just hormones that are necessarily involved in distress, which is usually epinephrine and norepinephrine. Usually those two, usually, but even then there's probably circumstances that I maybe don't know at the top of my head where in fact, um, they are not necessarily indicative of distress, but usually those two are the ones that are cited, except yeah. for the fact that that's not, you're not seeing people exhibiting high levels of adrenaline and noradrenaline on, on a carnivore diet. Like seriously, cite one person and tell me that that's a direct result of carnivore. You'll probably find so, that it's not if yeah. you dig deep but enough. I suppose at a basic physiological level, what we're saying, what they think stress is and what it actually is, is any threat to the homeostasis of the body anything that's what the body is looking at so if your mineral balance is, is slightly off that is a threat to homeostasis so you have all these hormones to regulate it um that's not stress that's just maintenance everything is maintenance of, of, of basically the balance of equilibrium and i think to keep labeling these hormones as troublesome or we haven't got enough and it's ridiculous they're trying to second guess the body and with not a joined up thinking model that they, they say one thing and as soon as i hear it i think well that's counterintuitive that doesn't actually make any sense like i say the t3 and the gluconeogenesis being one called self being another not understanding the hba1c trying to fix a glycation problem by introducing more glucose is absolutely ludicrous it, it is because necessarily you're going to be spiking your glucose if you're going to be eating 200 grams of it. Yeah. Like good luck trying to blunt all of the 200 grams by eating it with fat and protein. You might blunt it a little bit, but it's going to, you're going to get a spike if yeah. you eat that much, that much carbohydrate content. Like, and that's stressful when you're eating 10 times to maybe 30 times the amount of blood glucose um, that your body re requires in its five liters of blood. Surely that's a bit more stressful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think I think really that the word they're really looking for is distress. There's stress mm -hmm. and then distress because stress really just implies work. Like my heart is being stressed out right now because it's working. If you want absolutely mm -hmm. no stress whatsoever, you're you're looking at a dismal um, consequence and result, mm -hmm. uh, which is death. Okay. You you want absolutely no stress whatsoever, the body will be dead. Okay. What they're really talking about is distress, which is necessarily what they really mean by distress. The distinction is counterproductivity. Distress is, is amount of, an, an amount of work being put in that is not met by an equal gain, an equal return. You, that's typically what we're talking about when we're talking about distress. Are you in, and usually, therefore, you're going to present with symptoms if you're in a distressed state, if you're actually sick, if you're plagued with pathology. And they're really implying these enzymes. They're, they're, what they're really implying is that these, these hormones, not enzymes, these hormones are distressing to the body. They're inherently indicative of distress. 
And then that just loops us back around to what we were already talking about, which is not, that's not the case. It is a hormone. Cortisol is a hormone. It has a purpose. It is active in certain circumstances. Like that, that is not enough to say, oh, well, that may, oh, well, that must mean that you're, you're in a distressing state whenever you're in your, but this is the level, this is the level of logic that we're working with, yeah, with these people. Uh, this I is mean, the level of logic. Right. That's why you've got the diurnal test because we can see throughout the day, you tend to look like a sort of ski jump, doesn't it? Um, yeah. You know, we know that it's there, it's pulsatile, it's constantly going through, it's, it's doing its balances and checks when it's needed. After you've eaten, it goes up a little bit. You know, yep. when you've stopped, when you're sitting on a chair, looking out yeah. the window, it will go down a little bit. But it's mm -hmm. still at that constant level, really. Um, Obviously, the early morning, the dawn effect is is uh, going to put it up a bit, but it, it's it's practical. It's homeostatic. It's it. That's it. It's not a stress hormone. 